Tales from the Rails Discovering the Stockton and Darlington Railway The Railway that got the world on track Hello and welcome to our very first Tales from the Rails. My name is Caroline Hardy. And my name is Archie Mackay. I'm an archaeologist, a trustee for the charity The Friends of the Stockton and Darlington Railway, and I edit the Friends journal called The Globe. And that means I get to see quite a lot of the most recent research on the Stockton and Darlington Railway. And I'm the managing editor of South Western News. We are an independent publisher of community newspapers. One of the papers that we do publish is the Shildon Town Crier, which of course is published right here in the cradle of the railways. Our podcast, Tales from the Rails, is going to be monthly between now and 2025, when it will be 200 years since the Stockton and Darlington Railway opened. We'll be inviting lots of guests and taking the podcast out to the great outdoors. As this is our first, we're going to keep it simple today with just the two of us. Mostly, we do have Cleo the dog with us. I'm hoping she's not going to make much of a contribution. (laughs) I have to confess she was snoring just before we started recording. I'm hoping this will be so exciting she'll stay awake now. (laughs) So, what's Tales from the Rails all about? Well, it's all about the Stockton and Darlington Railway, of course. This railway opened officially on the 27th of September 1825 and that means in 2025 it'll be 200 years since that momentous day. This podcast is going to get us ready for the bicentenary events of 2025. We'll be exploring different aspects of the history of that world-changing railway including the engineering, the technology, the locomotives, the institutions, the hard lessons learned and the buildings and places associated with it. And stars of the S&DR will find out more about the people who worked on the railway, not just the big names like George Stevenson, but also less well-known folks such as the other George Stevenson, the children, the women, and yes, of course, the people who had the vision for something that simply hadn't existed before, like Edward Pease of Darlington. We'll be letting you know all about the events that are coming down the line. So fetch your diaries, make a cup of tea, put your feet up and enjoy the ride on the railway that got the world on track. We're going to try and make these podcasts about 45 minutes long, but who knows? Sometimes we get a bit overexcited and like a runaway train, we just can't stop. Other times we might end up down a siding. We'll see how it goes. Today's Tales from the Rails will concentrate on the opening day of the Stockton and Darlington Railway and hopefully it will help get you in the celebratory mood for 2025. Tales from the Rails. This podcast is brought to you by the Friends of the Stockton and Darlington Railway, a registered charity set up to safeguard and promote the heritage of the railway that got the world on track. You can join us by visiting our website at www. SDR1825.org.uk OK, thanks for that uh, introduction, Caroline. Um, and I must say, you know, it still gives me a bit of a tingle in my spine thinking that we're sitting here in this um, room at the moment recording this podcast coming up to the 200th anniversary of the Stockton and Darlington Railway, the railway that got the world on track. And we are literally... I think we can look out this window here and we can actually see the place where it all began. It still makes me uh, feel a bit tingly, all of that. It is amazing. In fact, out the window we can see Hackworth Park, named after Timothy Hackworth, mm. the S&DR's engineer. The pub over there is called the Royal George, named after one of his uh, locomotives. We're surrounded by history. Yeah, we are, aren't we? Shall we um, turn back the clock? Yeah, let's turn it back to the committee decision of the S&DR on the September the 9th, 1825. Thomas Maynell Esquire is in the chair. We're going to hear quite a lot from Thomas Maynell when it comes to the opening day of the Stockton and Darlington Railway. Although unexpected and unavoidable delays have attended the labours of your committee, they have at length the pleasure of congratulating you in the completion of the main line of your railway and the Darlington and Yarm branches, 
your committee have steadily proceeded in the execution of the works committed in their charge through great and unforeseen difficulties, and they trust that ere long the public will duly appreciate the advantages of your undertaking. Your committee are assured by the engineers and the main line with the Darlington and Yarm branches and a part of the Hagger Leases branch will be ready for public traffic by the 26th instance and your committee recommends the grand opening of the railway to take place on the following day. So the committee report went on to say that there was one locomotive and 150 wagons ready for the grand opening. There was a blacksmith's shop, a joiner's shop and an engine shed big enough for two engines which had been built at New Shildon, although the engine shed didn't actually have a roof by that date. About 20 men were already employed at New Shildon, including Timothy Hackworth, the Stockton and Darlington Railway's mechanical engineer. He'd been appointed the previous May. The reference to the completion of the line was a slight exaggeration. There had been problems getting enough gravel and stones for the track surface, so that wasn't quite finished. But this wasn't thought to cause any interruption to proceedings. And the stationary engine for Etherley Incline wasn't delivered until the 16th. And neither was that single locomotive, called Active, but now known as Locomotion No. 1. Nevertheless, the committee felt that it was time to get this massive infrastructure project on track. A notice was published in the local press on the 14th of September 1825, so not actually very long to plan this grand opening. Stockton and Darlington Railway. The proprietors of the above concern hereby give notice that their main line of the railway, commencing at Witton Park Colliery in the west of the country and terminating at Stockton-upon-Tees on the east, with several branches to Darlington, Yarm, etc., being about 27 miles in extent, will be formally opened for the general purposes of trade on Tuesday the 27th instant. He then went on to describe the programme for the day, including the use of a superior locomotive travelling engine, which will be employed with a train of convenient carriages for the conveyance of proprietors and strangers. Any gentlemen who may intend to be present on the above occasion will oblige the company by addressing a note to their office in Darlington as early as possible. I'm a bit cheesed off about it only being gentlemen, I have to say. (laughs) Um, Tickets were also issued to committee proprietors for themselves and an additional 10 issued to the chairman, plus shareholders were allowed an additional ticket for every 10 shares. Five days later, on the 19th, a handbill was printed by Atkinson's of High Row in Darlington and this had more detailed arrangements on it. The committee reminded their workforce of paying... Attention to the sobriety and decorum which they had hitherto had the pleasure of observing. And a warning which was to be largely unheeded, as was the attention to sobriety, come to think of it. All persons who shall ride upon or by the sides of the railway on horseback will incur penalties imposed by the Acts of Parliament passed relative to this railway. Last but not least, the passenger coach experiment was delivered from Newcastle on the 20th for VIP committee members from the railway company. Such was the excitement about this event that Darlington declared it to be a holiday. Take note, Darlington Borough Council for 2025. And people travelled from all across the region to observe the official opening. The sun rose at 6am on the 27th September 1825. But at 5.30am, workers had 20 wagons hauled by horse from Darlington to New Shildon. These wagons had been fitted up with seats for passengers. They were hitched behind locomotion number one, which was in steam outside the Mason's Arms, ready for her big moment along with the passenger coach experiment. So the Mason's Arm pub still stands, uh, but it's now called Cape to Cairo. The journey on the opening day started five miles further to the west, though. This was the hilly west section where no locomotive could manage the inclines. George Stevenson had therefore designed two incline planes powered by stationary steam engines to haul wagons up to the top of the hills and back down the other side. So at seven in the morning, six wagons laden with coal were brought from the coal mines near Witten Park, including Phoenix Pit and Etherley Pit, 
to the start of the Etherley Incline at the top end where Phoenix Row is today. This stretch of track and a tunnel under the road, now called Sloshy's Lane, at the new end crossroads hadn't been finished yet. The wagons were hitched to the rope that would haul them up to the top of the hill where the stationary engine and engineman's cottages were and gravity saw them down the other side to St Helen Auckland at seven in the morning. And when they got to the bottom, they were greeted with... A sense of gaiety and bustle was witnessed, surpassing perhaps anything that had ever occurred in that place before. Gentlemen's carriages, post chases, gigs, jaunting cars, wagons and carts filled with company, were seen entering the village from all directions, while equestrians mounted on spirited steeds and others on broken-down hacks and stupid donkeys added to the general effect, which was still further increased by a vast concourse of pedestrians who pressed forward, eager to behold a sight altogether new in that part of the country. I have to say that was a really long sentence written by the journalist for the Durham County Advertiser on the 1st of October 1825. So well done getting through that without (laughs) breathing. Uh, A wagon was added filled with sacks of flour uh, and then hauled along the level ground by horse over Stevenson's brilliant Gonless Bridge, of which more in another podcast, and hitched to another rope at the foot of Brusselton Incline. The stationary engine at the top of this hill hauled them up the incline and down the other side to New Shildon. Hundreds of people had gathered here already, ready to clamber on board, whether they booked a place or not, leading to the world's first incidents of overcrowding on a train. The six coal wagons and the wagon filled with sacks of flour were coupled to locomotion number one, along with the first purpose-built passenger carriage experiment – and those 20 other wagons brought from Darlington for the general public, surveyors and workmen all formed the train. The engine driver for the day was George Stevenson, while his brother Jem acted as fireman, and Timothy Hackworth, the company's engineer and locomotive superintendent, acted as guardsman. All the crew, including brakesmen, who were positioned between coupling on the wagons, wore blue sashes on their right shoulders, which tied below their left arm, while the other railway employees had blue ribbons in their buttonholes. So, um, I just thought I would take this moment, Archie, Mm -hmm. to give you a gift, which is a a blue ribbon biscuit. Now, I know you're on a diet, but it says on the pack it's only got 92 calories. (laughs) And the reason I'm doing this is because there's a significance in the fact that they all wore blue ribbons and Mm. blue sashes on the day because a blue ribbon at the time was associated with first-class quality. And a ribbon of blue silk was often given to the winner of a competition or as a mark of great distinction. Mm. So the Blue Ribbon Biscuit actually continues that trend. It was created in 1936 uh, by a Glasgow company, actually. It was then taken over by Rowtrees, which were a Quaker company. And we're back to the Quakers again because they largely funded this railway. Anyway, enjoy your biscuit. Well, thanks for that. And what I'll actually do with this Blue Ribbon Biscuit is I will keep it until after my diet, which will remain of first-class quality as well. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway... The flags and banners formed part of the procession too, and given how much was actually written on them, they must have been really big flags and banners. So their first flag was a large white flag inscribed Stockton and Darlington Railway opened for public use 27th September 1825. The company logo was shown, which had the Latin words Periculum Privatum Utilitas Publica, which is private risk for public service. And beneath this writing was a picture of a landscape with the train hauling wagons below Brusselton. A second flag, also with Periculum Privatum Utilitas Publica. And then there was a third flag with... Prosperity to the Stockton and Darlington Railway. And presumably a really big flag that said... May the Stockton and Darlington Railway give public satisfaction and reward its liberal promoters. The train set off at about 10 to 12 miles an hour and with the loud hooting and hissing that set horses scattering and people squealing, they'd never seen anything like this before. A herald on horseback with flags took the pole position at the front to warn people that the train was coming, but they soon got left behind by the train, which was much speedier. Others on horseback or carts or on foot ran alongside so that the procession was enormous. One horse rider, Mr J Lanchester, managed to get nearer to the locomotive hall train than everyone else, largely by cheating by joining the procession using a siding. And he stayed there despite the earlier warnings about penalties for doing so. There were two or three unofficial stops. 
Just outside Shildon, one wagon containing engineers and surveyors became derailed twice in quick succession, so it was shunted aside and the passengers squashed into other wagons. This was a hint that those 150 wagons purchased by engineer Thomas Storey were going to prove troublesome in the future. The other unofficial stop was when Active, or Locomotion No. 1, spluttered to a stop. George Stevenson got to the source of the problem. It was oakum in the tubes. And this is now a phrase I use regularly when there's a technical hitch or things go pear-shaped. What's oakum? Oakum is a rope a dipped in tar mm. and you use it to seal gaps. And you can still do it if you've got gaps around your windows or gaps in machinery. Mm. Anyway, some of that had got in the tubes and it shouldn't have been there. The train reached Darlington in 65 minutes, exclusive of these unofficial stops. And once in Darlington, the six wagons of coal were sent down the branch line towards North Road to be given to the town's poor. The workmen and all the wagoners left, apart from our friend Mr J Lanchester, who didn't want to relinquish its place at the front of the train, but everybody else went to take part in the convivialities arranged for them. Other passengers joined from Darlington. The engine refuelled and watered and Mr Maynell's band from Yarm embarked on two wagons behind Experiment so that the rest of the journey was accompanied by music. It was also accompanied as far as fighting cocks by the athletic Robson lads who tried to run alongside. At this point, Network Rail would probably like us to say... Don't try this at home, kids. Crossing the Durham Road now North Road, by level crossing, the train passed over one of the SNDR's largest structures, the Skern Bridge, designed by Durham architect Ignatius Bonamy. The railway company were very proud of this and used it on their headed notepaper and share certificates. People had gathered to watch on the valley sides on either side of the Skern, a scene much later painted by John Dobbin. Dobbin was there on the day, but he was only 10 years old. He painted his famous painting of the scene in 1874-1875 to mark the 50th anniversary. From the Skerrin Bridge, the railway had a gentle decline all the way to Stockton, allowing the train to reach higher speeds. There was one accident when a brakesman fell off his wagon and his foot was run over, and history has failed to record what happened to this poor man and his foot. On the approach to Stockton, where Preston Park is today the train reached speeds of 15 or 16 miles per hour. It was here on the Yarm Road that a horse-drawn coach with 16 passengers attempted to race the train with an estimated 600 passengers. I think we can guess who won. <laughs> the train arrived at Stockton's Quayside with its 600 passengers clinging on board and was greeted by a 21-gun salute and Mr Maynell's band played God Save the King, which was followed by... Three times three stentorian cheers. The band led a procession into town where the railway workers dispersed to their appointed eating places to celebrate. Now, Caroline, I've got a question for you because I remember always reading that there was a big worry about bringing trains in and using locomotives to transport passengers because people were worried about the speed that they would go at. There was always somebody positioned in front of the vehicle walking so that the thing couldn't travel at more than a walking pace. So is that not true then? Well, that's certainly what they started to do in the open day with the Heralds. Right. Um, But I think the Heralds eventually um, took, well, they were on horseback and they they moved to one side. But of course, they did that with cars in the early days, didn't they? Same sort of thing. The other thing people were worried about was travelling at such speeds. I've heard, um, allegedly, that they were worried about the uteruses in women exploding. Right. And at one stage, I read somewhere that somebody thought that magnetic north might change because the, after this opening day, the planet went on to be covered in so much ironwork, which was the rails, yeah. that it might move magnetic north. Thankfully, the uteruses of women and magnetic north are two of the things that didn't change as a result of the railways. <laughs> uh, anyway... Um, Going back to the end of the opening day, 102 official guests had been invited to a banquet, but only 99 turned up. I suspect the other two were travel sick, or maybe their uteruses had exploded. (laughs) And they were entertained to a banquet at Stockton's Town Hall. Mr Maynell, who was a shareholder and the chair of the SNDR, moved from being the band leader to the chair of the banquet. And along with the town's mayor, led 23 toasts most of whom were accompanied by music from Mr Maynell's band, which were located in a side room. So, 
just to give you an idea of the toast, and I presume these were all accompanied by alcohol, they were certainly accompanied by loud huzzas and cheers, and they often had music as well. So let's run through the toasts. To the King. To the Royal Family. Success to the Stockton and Darlington Railway. The Duke of York and the Army. The Duke of Clarence and the Navy. The Ladies. The Custos Rotolorum of the County, Justice of the Peace. The Lord Lieutenant of the County. The Members for the County. The Members for the City. Other Peers and Members of Parliament who assisted the company. The Mayor and Corporation of Stockton. Success to the projected Liverpool and Manchester Railway. There was a speech by the chairman of the Birmingham, Liverpool and Manchester Railway. The coal trade. The Tees Navigation Company. The chairman. The lead trade and other mining interests of the county. Absent members of the railway company. Solicitors of the railway company. Success to the Leeds and Hull Railway. Coal owners of the district who are connected to the railway. The ploughed, the loom and the sail. George Stevenson, the company's surveyor. However, an exhausted George Stevenson left before they got around to his toast. He was knackered. It'd been a long day, but the consensus was it'd been a successful one, with the value of shares increasing. Many people were buying shares, but nobody was selling them. It was less successful for Mr and Mrs Foxton, who provided the catering for the banquet in the town hall, because it would appear from the archives that they were never paid. It was also a sad day for the Pease family, Many historians have referred to the fact that Edward Pease, who was one of the main motivators and financiers for the railway, he wasn't able to attend the opening ceremony because his adult son, Isaac Pease, died on the night of the 26th, 27th of September. And maybe that toast to absent members of the railway company was aimed at him. However, Pease was from a generation of Quakers who thought that such celebratory events, full of loud huzzas, was a vanity. He wouldn't have attended anyway. The next SNDR committee meeting was October 1825 and they didn't even mention the opening day. That opening day has been celebrated regularly every 50 years in 1875, 1925 and 1975 because the world recognised that the Stockton and Darlington Railway was the start of something new, our modern railway that spread across the world. These celebrations have been national and international. In 2025, it will be 200 years since that momentous event, so we need to use the intervening period to get on track and to steam ahead to 2025. The 27th of September, 1825. The day that changed the face of the world. And I just want to take this opportunity to plug my book. If you want to share this story with the young'uns... Little Loco's Big Day covers most of this and it's aimed at children aged about six or seven years old or younger and it's beautifully illustrated. You can buy it from South West Durham News Offices in Shildon, where we are now, Locomotion in Shildon, the online shop, the railway station dot shop. If you just Google that, you'll find it. And that also has a web page devoted to Little Loco with lots of activities on it for children to do. You can also buy it on Amazon. Drake's Bookshop in Stockton, Waterstones in Darlington and the Teesdale Mercury Shop in Barnard Castle. And yes, we have copies here at the South Western News offices and I can certainly attest to the fact that it's a beautifully illustrated little book and a great story for the for the young uns. And it does also come with a QR code that takes you to that website and allows the little uns to get on with some of the activities there. Tales from the Rails, steaming ahead to 2025. So this is the bit of the podcast where we go through some events that are on the horizon, dates for your diaries and give a little bit of news as well. So we're kicking off the G5 Locomotive Company have started up their open days in Shildon again. They're open on the first Saturday of the month through to December and you'll find them in Hackworth Industrial Park. The postcode for that, if you want to find it, is DL41HF and you can check out how they're getting on building a new G5 locomotive. I'm really looking forward to one day going down there and seeing them. Actually, I've still not been able to do that. We have um, promoted the open days that they do have down there, sometimes in the Town Cryer newspaper, but... um, To this day, I've still not been able to get down, but I really do want to get down there and see them one day. 
it's really worth going and seeing what progress there is. And there's usually a cup of tea in it and they've got bits mm. of merchandise there as well. Uh, and, and they'll talk you through what they're doing. It's fascinating. Yeah. Now, the friends of the Stockman Darlington Railway meet on the first Thursday of each month at Darlington Cricket Club behind Sainsbury's. That meeting starts at 7pm and non-members are welcome to pop along. The campaign to rescue Hangton Station is now underway. Hangton was one of three railway taverns commissioned by the Stockton and Darlington Railway in 1826, alongside the freight depot of 1825. Not only did it provide refreshments and shelter for railway passengers while they waited on a train or used the depot next door, but it was a place where parcels and packages could be dropped off by train or collected. At a time when the railway station hadn't been invented, this was well on the way to being what we think of now as a railway station. This listed grade two-star building is under threat. It's lying empty, it's vandalised and it's underappreciated and we need to acquire it, restore it and make it economically viable once more. We'll do a podcast uh, on this in a few months' time, but it's uh, not too soon to help. I was out there, in fact, yesterday with Chris Lloyd and asked him what he thought. I'm Chris Lloyd. I am chief feature writer at the Northern Echo and I dabble in local history. And why do you think we should save Hangton Station, Chris? Um, I think um, it provides a real connection back to the earliest days, the very earliest days of the railways, 1825. And just with a little imagination, you can transport yourself back through time to the opening day of the railway. You can see locomotion number one actually passing along there. And uh, you can see the people milling around here. And of course, even before the opening day of the railway, this is where um, locomotion number one was put on the tracks somehow. And there's that fantastic story. You can imagine it, uh, it being bolted together just over there and um, because John Walker of Stockton had yet to invent the, ma- invent the match um, they couldn't let get the boiler lit according to the story and so they sent someone back down this road here back into Acliff to try and get a lantern of some sort um, but a chap called Robert Metcalf um, I think from Darlington just happened to be hanging around smoking his pipe and he allegedly used the rays of the sun to get the uh, local up and running before the in that wonderful history takes place just here. Locomotion number one exploded here, didn't it, in 1828, killing its driver quite terribly and making the upper, making his pumper look like a Dalmatian for the rest of his life before the exploded hot water. So all of that sort of stuff takes place just here. And so this building kind of represents all of that and um, means that you can actually touch and feel that history. So um, I get excited by just getting people to be kind of hands-on on their history and that's what this building represents and it'd be so embarrassing if in 2025 um, people turned up from around the world and just came to see a, a site of complete dereliction where these world changing events took place so what do you think would make a good use for the building once it's been restored assuming you don't want to blow up any more engine drivers <laughs> no um well it, it, the obvious thing to do is to uh, uh, it, it can't just kind of stay there um, with no use, so it has to kind of, uh, wash its face, I believe is the modern terminology for these things. So it has to operate either as some form of a holiday home or as a... Um, and there would be people, I think, who would be interested, in railway people from around the world, to be interested in staying in the world's first station. That's a great selling point. Um, and, and the only other thing is to make use of it as... Um, a, uh, a, as a pub or a restaurant of some sort. People are talking about it being a Georgian themed pub. Um, and I'm not a great fan of dressing up, but, um, but, uh, but it will. Um, that sort of thing does take it back to its original time. And of course, it is so important that these things don't just stand there as museum pieces that people can kind of get inside and see them all. Um, uh, and so that would be an ideal use. Well, I'm sorry about the sound quality and that. You can tell it was a really windy day. It was also raining cats and dogs. It was thoroughly unpleasant, uh, and you can tell that from the recording. Anyway, in the meantime, there are two things that you can do to help save Hyington Station. It costs nothing to sign the petition supporting the project. This will help us get grant aid. Just go to the Friends webpage at sdr1825.org.uk forward slash save dash Hyington dash station that's sdr1825.org.uk and you can follow the link there to the station petition 
We're also trying to raise funds to buy and restore the building. Uh, We will be applying for grant aid, but we need to raise about 20% of the cost ourselves. It's actually quite a lot of money because the building actually needs a lot spending on it. If you can spare a bit of cash, please go to our Just Giving page at www.justgiving.com forward slash campaign forward slash save dash Hyington dash station. Alternatively, just go to the Friends web page and click on the tab for Save Hyington Station and it will take you to this as well. If you can't spare the cash, then just sign the petition. But if you can, please do both. Yes, indeed. And um, we'll list uh, the events that we've just spoken about there um, in the podcast notes so that you'll be able to read about them later on as well while you're while you're listening to the podcast. And we'll also include links on there as well. So you'll be able to click on some of the links that we've been mentioning and um, visit some of those pages, including the page to buy Caroline's book. Related to this, uh, date for the diary, Saturday the 9th of March from two o'clock until half past four, how the Railways Came to Highington History Day. That's in St Michael's Church at Highington. Tickets are £5. If you go to the Friends webpage again, click on the events page and that will take you to a link there where you can buy the tickets. Yeah, now on the 15th of March at half past ten in the morning, there's a guided walk taking place along the Etherley Incline which will start at Phoenix Row. It's preferable for people to register so that we have your details, just in case there's any last-minute change of plan. Uh, You'll find more details, again, on the Friends webpage under the Events tab. There's uh, work continuing on the walking cycling track that's going to run alongside the route of the 1825 main line for about 26 miles. This is well underway in County Durham, and so far the existing track's been improved at Hags Lane near Brusselton Bankfoot. More works are going to continue to take place over the next few months, so you might uh, spot people out there working hard in all weathers, getting it ready for 2025. Money to do this has come from the Leveling Up Fund, uh, and it was meant to be finished by the end of March, but we've had such terrible weather over winter, the deadline's been extended to September 2024. Sadly, progress in the Darlington and Stockton council areas is not going so well due to lack of funds. So ultimately, the walking route may be a mixture of train travel, walking and a few diversions off the route. Friends area groups have been busy around Skernbridge in Darlington and at Fighting Cox, litter picking and battling with self-seeded vegetation, mostly of the prickly variety. Area groups are all looking for more volunteers uh, to look after their stretch of the line. These activities are important in recognising that if we want people to travel across the world to explore the internationally important remains of the Stockton and Darlington Railway, then the site really should look like it is cared for. You can select an area an area group to join when you join the friends at sdr1825.org.uk but you can also volunteer without joining. It all helps. Just contact us through the website and we'll put you in touch with the right people. As part of improvements to Darlington Bank Top Station, which is they're going to be ready for 2025, Network Rail is to build two new platforms in a £99 million project. Platform 5 will be a southbound through platform for long distance services and Platform 6 a bay platform serving the lines to and from Eaglescliff, which is on the SNDR route. Both will sit outside the station's current train shed but will be linked to it by a new bridge that will be installed as part of the work that's underway to build a new eastern concourse. What this means in the short term is hoardings, problems parking and a relocated ticket travel centre, so better leave extra time for train journeys. Tickets are now available for the latest talk by the Friends of the National Railway Museum, North East Branch. Join Chris Nettleton to explore Darlington's railways with photographs and film from the 1950s and 60s. This talk is on Saturday the 24th of May at 10.30 at Locomotion Sunday School in Shildon. Tickets are free, but you need to book them at Locomotion's website, which is locomotion.org.uk. And again, as I said, um, lots of these links will be in the show notes. 
And finally, one of my favourite little sites, uh, the Friends of the Thorpe Light Railway. Uh, They're going to start their open days on the 21st of April and they'll continue through to September. Um, They run from half past 12 until 3. Now, Thorpe Light Railway is uh, quite close to the A66. Uh, Whirlton Village is the nearest village. It's not too far from Greta Bridge um, on the A66. Just bear in mind that the delightful early 19th century suspension bridge that uh, crosses the River Tees at Walton is still out of action, so you have to take a more circuitous route coming in from the A66. Entry fee to this site is £3.50 per person, under fives and members of the Friends of the Thorpe Light Railway. They get in for nothing. Now, for that £3.50, you can ride on their 15-inch railway behind a little locomotive as many times as you like. Uh, There are teas and coffees there as well and a great big field. And if the weather's nice, you can have picnics. And my dog's been on this. She quite likes it, but she's broader than the gauge of the train. And that means her nose and her tail stick out either side. And that can be a bit of an issue when we're going through the tunnel. But it's a really lovely way to spend the day. Stars of the SNDR. So this is the bit where we look at an individual associated with the SNDR and shine the spotlight on them. So this is the story of Story and is based on research by Peter Singlehurst, John Raw and myself, Caroline Hardy. So Thomas Story, he was born in 1789 and he he died in 1859 and he was one of the many talented people brought to the Stockton and Darlington Railway through their connections with George Stevenson. Born in Make Me Rich Farm near Pontyland, and there's some really fantastic names in this part of the world I know, for I, places. I, I hope it made them rich. <laughs> Born in Make Me Rich Farm near Pontyland on the 7th December 1789 to Alice Story, Nee Hindmarsh, and William Story. He went on to be educated at Stamfordham. He served the apprenticeship under Mr. Watson of Willington and then in Lancashire where he was employed by Messrs Clark, Roscoe and Co as their mining engineer in Lancashire, in Wales and in Shropshire too. He married Elizabeth Scott around 1810 and together they had six children. So he was related to George Stevenson through his mother Alice, who was the sister of George's second wife, Elizabeth Hindmarsh. Thomas was released from his employment in 1822 in order to join Stevenson on the Stockton and Darlington Railway as their civil engineer. So he moved to St Helen, Auckland to be near his work and spent the rest of his life there. Between 1822 and 1825, before the line was opened, Thomas was in charge of the construction of the Stockton and Darlington Railway from Whitton Park Colliery to Hinton Lane, now on the edge of Newton Acliffe. He also oversaw the construction of the first engine men's houses at Etherley and Brusselton. Local tradition suggests that for some time he lodged at what is now the Manor House Hotel in West Auckland before setting up home with his family. Amazingly, his house survives at 67 Manor Road, which at the time was called Main Road or Front Street at St Helen Auckland. Local people might be familiar with it as it used to be the Wheat Chief Inn. It's now a private house though. It's slightly that Storey had the house built when he took up his permanent post as engineer with the SNDR in 1825. The wall that enclosed his garden was designed with a dip in it so that Storey could observe the workings of the railway from his home. He also had a path running directly from the east side of the house to the incline. You could see that on later Ornance survey maps. And in fact, that path still exists at the side of the house. As engineer to the Stockton and Darlington Railway, Story's work extended along the whole line, but mostly as far as Darlington. This included supervising the construction of the Hagger Leases branch line, designing the Skew Bridge near its terminus, surveying the Middlesbrough branch line and the alternative route not chosen at Haverton Hill in 1827. He attended parliamentary committees to be cross-examined on the proposed Middlesbrough branch in 1828, designed a stone bridge to cross the old route of the River Tees, oversaw and contracted out the work on the Middlesbrough branch, much of his work overlapping with the work on the Hagger leases. He also designed and oversaw the construction of the goods shed at North Road in Darlington between 1832-3, designed the new bridges 
as part of the widening of the Stockton and Darlington Railway main line in 1831-33 to and trained up the S&DR's next engineer, John Harris, who took over in 1836. It's no wonder at the opening ceremony of the Hagger Leases branch in 1830, one of the many toasts was to... Mr Storey, whose professional skill and individual perseverance the company and the public alike are indebted. So here's a bit of gossip now. In the early days of the railway, some friction arose between Storey and Timothy Hackworth, who was the S&DR's locomotive superintendent. Now, Hackworth lived in New Shildon and Storey, St Helen, Auckland. Both Storey and Hackworth had to attend the S&DR committee meetings in Darlington on Fridays. A stagecoach mounted on railway wheels was used for the conveyance of passengers and when it arrived at Shildon from West Auckland and St Helen Auckland on its way to Darlington, if Storey was riding on the top, Hackworth invariably got inside. But if Storey was inside, Hackworth would go on top, even if it was wet and stormy. The cause of this hostility is unknown, but both had jobs with considerable overlap and a dependency on each other for successful outcomes. So Storey was a civil engineer, so he designed the physical structures such as engine houses, the railway formation and bridges. But Hackworth was a mechanical engineer, so he designed the machinery, the locomotives and the engines that were housed within or ran on those structures. That interdependence may have led to strained relations if one perceived that the other wasn't working to the same standard. By 1834, Pigott & Co's directory listed him as Thomas Storey, surveyor and civil engineer under St Helens with no reference to the railway. However, his replacement, John Harris, did not take up post until 1836. So perhaps about this time, Storey moved from the SNDR to the GNER where he became engineer-in-chief surveying the line between Darlington and York and designing 77 bridges between the two towns. Only one of them collapsed. When he resigned from GNER in 1841, because it was not finished on time, he was presented with a splendid dinner service of silver plate. Storey moved on to carry out consultancy work for the SNDR and other railways, and so he was the consulting engineer for the Prince of Wales Tunnel at Shildon in 1842. He also projected and formed the Auckland and Weardale Railway, which opened in 1842 as well, and designed the first Bishop Auckland Station, which opened in 1843. Thomas Storey took over the existing West Auckland Iron and Brass Foundry as a going concern, possibly after resigning from the GNER in 1841. The foundry now lies under the 1970s road called Oakley Green. One of his additional businesses was as a developer building houses, including a row in Flintoff Street, just off Newgate Street in Bishop Auckland in the mid-1840s. Flintoff was his daughter Hannah's married name, she and her family later emigrated to Australia. He also owned a row of houses next to his own in St Helen, Auckland. So, he became a businessman of significant means and continued to view the growing s and from his garden with the dip in the wall, although by his death the Brussels incline was little used. He died after a short illness on the 15th of October 1859, aged 70 years old. This was only three days after Robert Stevenson, whose death dominated the local press, and so Storey's demise was overlooked in the media. His obituary was published by the Institution of Civil Engineers, and they described him. In person, Mr Storey was tall and athletic, and capable of undergoing great fatigue. He possessed great decision of character, and was deservedly respected for his strict integrity and honesty of purpose. He was as scrupulously just as an employer towards those who served under him as he had been when an agent to those under whom he served. During the last few years, he lived in retirement, his health not permitting him to undertake any great public work. Thomas is buried in the churchyard at St Helen, Auckland, with other family members. You can still see his headstone today. If this has got you in the mood to plan your own celebratory event, there are people out there to help. Small amounts of funding are available and the festival director, Nikki Halifax, will help to coordinate the events, which will all be promoted from September 2024. 
There's a single email address to contact people to ask for help, and that is info at sdr200.co.uk. And if you need help getting your facts right for your event or help with business advertising, use the pioneering innovation of the Stockton and Darlington Railway, then just contact the friends of the SDR via their webpage, which again is www.sdr1825.org.uk. Next month, we'll be looking at why the SDR was so important and why we should be commemorating it locally, regionally, nationally, and yes, internationally. So until next time, it's goodbye from me, Caroline Hardy. And it's choo-choo from me, Archie Mackay.